celebrate what Jesus is doing throughout the nation and rise up to answer His call on your life. To serve the poor, heal the broken, free the captives, and bring joy to those in need. Find hope, encouragement, and motivation through Overcomers TV. This inspiring network features everyday people and ministries across America who are putting God's love in action. Tune in to Overcomers TV on your favorite app or streaming platform. It's time to overcome. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another interview on Overcomers TV Live. I'm Pastor Chuck. The honor and privilege to introduce to you some of our ministry partners and friends. Our next guest, Dr. Dave Anderson, Grace School of Theology. Dr. Anderson, thank you so much for jumping on with us today. Yeah, glad to be here. So theology might be my favorite subject. Uh, the Word of God is amazing. Uh, we were talking about it before we went live. Um, but, uh, you know, Overcomers TV is really all about people with faith, right? We overcome by faith. First John 5, 4 is our key verse. Whoever's born of God overcomes. This is the victory that we have over the world and everything it has to offer. Our faith. So, and then verse 5 says, who's an overcomer but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Talk a bit about your faith journey. How did Jesus become real to you? And eventually, I'm sure that led to a life of ministry. Well, Chuck, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, had enough credits to graduate after three years. And my parents wanted me to go on to college, but I wanted to have another year of maturity so I could play sports in college. So I talked them into a year at a prep school in Chattanooga, the Macaulay School, same place where Ted Turner went uh, to high school where he says he became a Christian three times. <laughs> <laughs> I always enjoyed that. That's <laughs> anyway, they made us uh, uh, take a course in the Bible to graduate. And when I got to the Ten Commandments, I said, well, I've done whatever I want to do academically, athletically. I think I'll just keep these for 30 days. I read through the list and uh, didn't see any of them I was really breaking except false witness. A friend of mine and I were the two hell raisers in the class. And we broke every school rule we could without getting caught. But uh, spring of that year, I did get caught and I told a lie. Uh, and they decided to send me home to Nashville for three days. I knew they wouldn't kick me out because I'd gotten in schools like MIT and Stanford. Uh, they said, well, why don't you apply to Rice in Houston? I'd never heard of Rice. I thought it was a, something in China. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I said, well, why would I want to go there when I can go to MIT? And I said, well, it's free. So it turned out Rice was this tiny little school where William Marsh Rice gave his fortune that anyone who got in, it was free. And uh, so I said, OK, I'll, I'll do that. But when I, I, when I told this lie and I was on the back seat of the Greyhound bus headed to Nashville, it, it, uh, I was convicted this happened in the my, middle of my 30-day test. Right. And all of a sudden, I realized I was a sinaholic, uh, that I couldn't stop sinning because I tried hard. Of course, I, I didn't have a good understanding of sin. Right. But from what I did, I understood the Ten Commandments somewhat, and I knew I'd broken them. So on the back of that bus, I said, all right, Jesus, if you really rose from the dead, then you're somewhere on this bus. Then I, I, I want you to forgive me of my sins. And uh, yeah, I need a savior. So, boom, I was different. I'd, I'd never heard a Billy Graham. I'd never seen a gospel tract. Uh, as far as I know, I'd never heard an evangelistic sermon. Yeah. But I knew I was different. And I uh, I used to cuss a lot. And that just, boom, went away. I just, just went away. And uh, so I knew I wanted to read the Bible. So I, no one told me to read John, so I read Proverbs for three days. All right. <laughs> That's Proverbs. good. You got smarter. The book Proverbs. of wisdom. <laughs> Proverbs is tough on you, though, man. It cuts and stabs. Anyway, I remember I the first time I read Proverbs, I'm like, this is like fortune cookie stuff. These are great one liners, man. Know how to put these in fortune cookies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I went down to Rice, and uh, a guy was starting his ministry with Camps Crusade for Christ. He was going alphabetically. My last name starts with A. So he got a hold of me, and he explained to me what had happened to me on the bus. Then he mentored me through college. I went through the pre-med program. I thought, well, uh, I'll use my science math background to be a doctor. But 
uh, I was working in an emergency room down there called Ben Tov, the largest one in the state, on Saturday nights. And that was as, as exciting as medicine gets, frankly. But it didn't, once I learned how to lead people to Christ, it didn't pale in comparison to yeah. that. In fact, I learned on Balboa Beach and Newport Beach in California. Uh, went by and, and saw the old Calvary Chapel site where they started. Uh, but anyway, uh, once I learned to witness, uh, that's kind of all I wanted to do. Yeah. So I decided yeah. to go on to seminary and uh, thought I'd be a missionary, but all the mission boards in those days want to take your kids away from you when they're six years old. Wow. And that seemed to fit with what I had learned about the Christian home. Right. So I told my wife, I don't know what we'll do. So I said, well, let's just pray. Well, six, six weeks later, got a call from a little town north of Houston who wanted to start a church. So I said, well, that's kind of like missionary work. Are you going to take my kids away? And they said, no, you can keep your kids. Right. <laughs> so we went down there and did that. And yeah. then we started 10 more churches, started a couple of Christian schools, K through 12. And then, uh, then I pastored for 40 years. And I started this Bible college and seminary in 07. We started with seven students. Now we have over 700. And, wow, that's uh, awesome. I had a vision of going to the nations because the Great Commission doesn't say come. It right. Says go. Right. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there are a thousand evangelistic organizations out there. But the last half of the uh, Great Commission is teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Mm -hmm. And so they need the Christian leaders in these countries. And uh, so we're in 44 countries teaching in 10 different languages. And we're the only school in America that's accredited that's doing that. Right. Uh, wow. So God's really blessed us. It's been a, so you're a, making disciple makers. That's good. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your role, your involvement with the ministry. You know, you well, probably, I'm the founder and president, but I also right. teach uh, advanced Greek exegesis. Uh, my PhD is in the Greek New Testament. Yeah. I also teach in the English Bible department, and I teach in the theology department. For example, I teach soteriology which is basically the study of how to go to heaven. Right. So you talked about the Great Commission. I know every organization has a vision statement, a mission statement in writing, but I always love to ask, what, how, what's the heartbeat? How do you describe it? Yeah, our vision is to raise up Christian leaders in every country of the world who can teach others about the love of Christ, a love that you can't earn and you can never lose. Yeah. Second Timothy 2.2. 2. Since 2022, yeah. that's just been popping out at me. I saw a billboard with the you know, the Christmas uh, ball is the zero. And it's that two, two, two. Every time I see it, I think about that, where Paul says, these things you've heard, you've seen in me, teach to other faithful men so they can teach others. And that's the multiplication model, right, that uh, that we've yeah. been given. When I started my uh, first church there in that little town north of uh, Houston, out of that have come 50 young men have gone into ministry. Some of them have gone on to Oxford in England and uh, University of Chicago. They're now seminary professors and uh, some of them have been missionaries just and that's that's the most rewarding part it's, it's it's pretty close to third john where he says i have no greater joy than to see that my children walk in the truth amen amen to that because the devil's a liar he's a deceiver and uh what always amazed me and you're the theologian here uh you know when we receive christ or receiving the holy spirit uh john 14 6 15 16 he elaborates a little bit about the role of the Holy Spirit, the helper, uh, the counselor. He also reveals all truth. But uh, then, you know, Paul has a few verses like 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Don't be deceived. Uh, and he'll, you know, lay out a couple things like, you know, adulterers, fornicators, a list of folks that will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And such were some of you. You were changed. But he starts a, a few verses in the New Testament. Do not be deceived. I'm like, well, if I got the Holy Spirit. Some people are just overly confident that whatever their conclusions are, they must be right because I have the Holy Spirit. But we can still be wrong about some things. We can be deceived, and we're kind of working it out, right? Talk a little bit about that process. Well, you know, it says we all see through a glass darkly. So no single person has a corner on the truth. I think uh, when we get to heaven, he'll say, well, you got the gospel right or you wouldn't be here. That's for the rest of us. School starts tomorrow. We have a lot to learn. Why do you think we have eternity? <laughs> Amen. Forever and ever. That's like redundant, yeah. right? Forever yeah. and ever. Exactly. 
But you know, it says in Second Thess too that even the elect will be deceived in the last time. So uh, we can still be led astray by a false teaching. And you get some of these theologies, uh, like dispensational versus reform, right. and they're for the most part diametrically opposed. Well, they're not both right, you know. So right. you, you know, you, you get into all that, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's I, good. And we talked about it earlier. I always say we're all a bunch of wrinkled dress shirts. One one morning I was ironing out my shirt and I got all the way to the other sleeve and I picked it up and I had a big old wrinkle that wasn't even there before. And, and I was like, man, I already did that part. And I really felt like the voice of God is like, you know, you're a lot like that shirt. I've had to iron you out a couple times in the same spot. <laughs> Backsliding. <laughs> we already went over this. Come on, get back up, pick it back out of the mud. Well, but, the temptation you know, of knowledge, is patient, love yeah. is kind, right? God is patient. The temptation love, of knowledge is, is to be puffed up. The scripture yeah. says, "Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up." Amen. But again, as I mentioned to you earlier, I think the more we know, the more we don't you know. We don't know. Right. And I think increased knowledge should be a humbling thing, right? Not, not something so, to be proud of. So let's talk about evangelism. You know, um, I'll throw out a couple of verses first. You know, Mark sixteen fifteen. You know, preach this gospel. To every living creature, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who don't believe are condemned. The emphasis, I believe, is on that second half. Those who don't believe are condemned. A lot of people, because of that first part, believe and be baptized, they start thinking you have to be baptized to be saved. I mean, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord is saved, and those who are saved get baptized. And it's funny how Christians argue over these things. I mean, baptism is an outward uh you know, like a ring didn't make me married. We made the vow. We took the covenant. And then I put the outward demonstration that we took the vow on my finger. The ring didn't make me married. But I think baptism is an outward witness. It's a sign. And I know a lot of Christian camps like to argue over that who's saved. And then there's a whole camp that says, you know, because in the book of Acts, they started speaking in tongues. And if you haven't spoken in tongues and you haven't received the Holy Spirit, I'm like, that's just one of that's evidence of a gift. One of the gifts God gives, because there's so many other Bible verses that says that not everybody has tongues or healings or miracles. So, you know, it's good we're talking about it amongst ourselves because maybe somebody might overhear it and actually hear the gospel. But, um, you know, there's certain camps that can be really dogmatic about what it takes to be saved. I mean, it, right. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Talk about the gospel and evangelism. A clear message. Well, the first thing I want to say is uh, we're all ignorant. We're all ignorant of probably 999 percent of what's out there to know. Yeah. Taking in all the knowledge available. Right. And so there's there's nothing wrong with being ignorant. Now, when people start getting, uh, you know, uh, dogmatically ignorant, uh, then I, I start getting nervous because of what I said <laughs> earlier. I think you have to temper what we know with the fact right. that we see right. through a glass right. darkly. So when people start getting aggressively, uh, dogmatically ignorant, then they get real nervous. Right. And there are yeah. some groups out there like that. Yeah. But uh, I think the gospel is simple. I think the book of John is the only book written ostensibly to uh, bring us eternal life. That's what it says in John twenty thirty one. These I have written that you might believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might have life through his name. Yeah. The only requirement is you see John is to believe. Right. Yeah. To. Yeah. I mean, more verses talk about be belief and yeah. that belief, I think, is even a bigger word than just I believe he exists. You know, like there's yeah. a chair over in the corner. I believe it's there, but it's really doesn't have any fruit or any bearing on my life. I'm not obeying it. I'm not listening to it. Mm -hmm. So you can have a head knowledge about Jesus, just like the president of the United States. I use that as an analogy, whether it was Trump or Biden. I know where he lives. I know his policies, whether they're red or blue. And um, but I've never met him yet. So I think a lot of people have heard about Jesus, may even know some of the commandments and do's and don'ts and policies within the Christian you know, religion, but they still haven't had a personal encounter with Jesus yet. And Jesus said, I won't turn away anybody who comes to me. I mean, that's his policy. You come to Jesus and then you work your way to getting baptized and then, you know, learning and following. He says, those who love me will keep my commandments. Well, how can you? You know, when I first met him, I'm, I'm learning to love him. I know what I've been saved from. I know what I've been saved for. Now I'm falling in love with Jesus. Now I have a desire to keep his commandments, right? So, you know, it, all that to we, say. We have, yeah. a, we have a basic uh, evangelistic principle to go by. It's this one. Yeah. 
Jesus cleans his fish after he catches them. <laughs> Amen. Right. Exactly. That's pretty, yeah. That's pretty profound, isn't it? It's as is. Come to Jesus as is, and then yeah, that's that sanctification process is what right. we call discipleship. And again, that's really the Great Commission you mentioned it earlier, teaching people to obey or observe all that I've commanded. And obviously, he's bottom line, the two greatest commandments, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that's really what we're, and how does that live out, right, uh, in, in a daily practical. So we're trying to hold each other accountable. Um, I love Hebrews 10, 24. That's really the single-handedly why we started this show. So let us consider one another. At the more and more as you see the day approaching, the day, I always think that's the last day or his appearing day. And let us you know, consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, because it's the love and the good works that are going to open up the door for talking about Jesus and sharing that uh, word and deed. Right. They go hand in hand. Some people do a lot of talking. They're not helping anybody. Then there's people doing a lot of helping, but they're scared to bring up Jesus and, you know, and and the scriptures because they don't want to offend anybody, but they have to go hand in hand, right? Talk a little yeah, bit about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, we're supposed to be ready to have an answer for the hope that's within us. Yeah. I know myself, the first time I tried to witness, I really blew it. I was on the basketball team at Rice and it was a, my best friend on the team. And that ended the friendship. So I went silent for about two years. And then, uh, then through Camp say they took me out to the beach in California. Uh, learn to witness. And w without that training, I don't think I would right. be witnessing very much. Right. So I think the first thing someone has to do uh, to be an effective witness is have some training. You need a track yep. to run from. Right. And you can apply it differently as you run into different individuals right. and their place in life. But the basic message is the same. We're sinful right. people. Right. We keep us from God. Jesus went across the gap through the cross. Paid for yeah. our sins. Right. But I went to a, a church uh, in, in Nashville. My, you know, We read the Apostles' Creed every Sunday. Right. And I believed it. But it wasn't until that bus that I had what you're calling a personal encounter with Jesus. Right. And he became my Savior, and I was born again. Yeah, amen. That's good. I'm a Ray Comfort fan. And um, I love because he, he knows how to ask good questions and with strangers and gets them talking. And some some will say to him, he says, you know, well, you have a real gift for evangelism. He's like a gift he goes, I've been practicing for 40 years. I mean, practice, <laughs> you know, that's like looking at a marathon runner after 26 yeah. miles of running a marathon. So you have a real gift for running is like, what are you talking about? I've been training. I've been denying myself chocolate chip cookies. You know, I yeah. trained to run a marathon and. It's the same thing with evangelism and discipleship. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, right? Uh, study yourself to be an approved worker uh, by God and to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. So the more we read, and it's amazing the Holy Spirit's job back to his his role, is that he'll recall something you might have, you know, you'll recall it like you just read it five minutes ago. And, and if you read the word, you know, God gives them something to work with to recall a biblical principle and to be able to talk about truth, you know, the way it's presented in scripture and maybe even paraphrase it a little bit for someone to understand. And I love how Jesus taught in parables, right? He used stories and teaching people to share their testimony. Um, Overcomers TV, we talk about Revelations 12, 11 a lot. They overcame the evil one uh, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So, you know, not a lot of people like good preaching unless, you know, we're digging in the word and we want to grow unbelievers i think it's like bug spray to them they run from preachers <laughs> but they'll, you, they'll they'll listen to your story and they'll see god in it right amen well it says the holy spirit will convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment so as we walk the walk and talk the talk both of them i think the holy spirit uses us as vessels to to make that happen as you i'm sure yeah. you've heard and probably preached uh you may be the best bible someone reads any time in life Amen. And you know what? I heard recently that uh, only one third of the world can read and half the languages don't even have a written text yet. It's all oral. So God says he used the foolishness of the preaching to save those who believe. And that's why I love what you guys are doing. You're training up people who know how to go out and, you know, preach the word of God. And obviously the key, too, is raising up national leaders, people who know the culture already, already know the language, somebody cross culture. There's years of learning the culture and the language before they're even 
able to start trying to catch fish. Right. right? We've got uh, probably 100 students in Cuba. And uh, oh, we're just now opening up Tanzania, and we're going to use their language. Uh, Philippines, we use Tagala. Right. And English, we have both. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. In uh, Kazakhstan, we have 80 students, and we teach in Russian. That's good. Yep. That's good. Well, I'm going to bring up your website. We do this show because we're trying to raise awareness of different ministries, boots on the ground that are doing the work of ministry. So the body of Christ can get involved, pray for them, support them. As a school, I know there's probably some tuition, but it needs to be supported like any other ministry, whether it's a homeless shelter or a children's home. Tuition, you know, the, uh, there's a lot to run a school. Talk about ways people can get involved and support a, a ministry like Grace School of Theology. Well, I, I would start off by taking some courses if I were you. We have a uh, uh, 18 courses you can get <clears throat> as an individual subscription for 100 bucks. Uh, if you're a church, you can get for everyone in your whole church for $500. That's amazing. Wow. That's 18 courses. Take a few courses and you'll get a feel for what we're doing. But uh, you can get uh, a bachelor's degree here. You can get a master of ministry with 30 hours, a master of biblical studies for 60 hours, a master of divinity for 90, a THM for 120, and then a doctor of ministry after that. And we're working on our PhD program. So all across yeah. the board uh, are, are things that are offered. And right. I, I, I think if you get involved in one of those ways, you you might get a heart for the ministry to see what we're yeah. about. Amen. Then, if, you, if you want to support financially, that's great. But, uh, we are uh, the one re a, See, we only charge here in America the average tuition price is 650 bucks a credit hour. So if you take one course, you can do the math. Multiply 650 by three. So you're, 19, you're almost $2,000 for one course. We charge $260 an hour, which is about a third of what's, uh, what's, what's being charged on average. And then when then as we go abroad, we scale it uh, to the country's economy. So in Germany, we charge our regular 260 an hour. But in Cuba, we charge them $1 an hour. In Nepal, we have 40 students. We charge them $1 a credit hour. In Mexico, we charge $30 an hour. In the Philippines, we charge $15 an hour. Now, the only way we can do that, and the reason we're the only school in America doing this, is that they can't handle the finances of doing what we're doing. We do it because some people have been blessed financially, uh, like my, the school at Rice I went to, which was free have provided the money to sub, uh, uh, give scholarships, you might say, to all these people. And so our budget's about five million bucks, and 90% uh, uh, of that is just donations. And I don't go around raising money. I never have. People just hear the vision. They come to me and say, we like what you're doing. We want to be part of it. So. Hey, man, that's really good. Yeah, you got to... You know, teamwork makes a dream work. When I get to heaven, you mentioned we have forever and ever. I'm hunting down cliche writers. So somebody had to say these phrases first, right? Like Amen. birds of a feather flock together. Yeah. I think denominations are a lot like that between worship styles, preaching styles, and maybe even doctrine position. But, you know, at the end of the day, I love what Jesus prayed in John 17, that we, you know, become one as he is one. You know, this is eternal life to believe in God and the one whom he sent. And there we go back to, was that John 17, 3? Right. No, that's not what it says. It says to know I, God. To know God. Okay. To know yeah. so, which means experiencing God. That's where right. Black we got his, his series, Experiencing God, from that verse. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and then 1717, sanctify them by your truth, right? Your word is truth. Amen. So, you know, I, even as a preacher, I love to talk about the word, but... <laughs> what does Proverbs say? Where sin, words abound, sin is not lacking. So we can over preach it, over teach it. <laughs> you know, so get back to a verse really quick and you're safe. <laughs> you know, James says, don't many of you be teachers, you'll receive the stricter judgment. If a man doesn't offend in, his, in, in time, he's a perfect man. There aren't too many of us who are perfect. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I said, you know, and I, I you know, I went, I went to, uh, I don't know if you know Arnold Fruchtenbaum. He's a Messianic Bible teacher up in Camp Shoshana. It, they're based out of San Antonio, Ariel Ministries. We were classmates. Uh, yeah, 
And uh, I've learned a lot from him because, you know, there's a lot of Jewish culture and history yeah. that we just don't know as Gentiles, the backstory, you know. No, Arnold and, and I spent four years together at seminary. <laughs> Short little man. He always says, you know, Jesus yeah. was probably about 5'4", because he was 5'4". <laughs> it's funny. He's pretty, you know, he's a lecturer. He's a little dry, but he's got some pretty funny jokes. He, One of his favorite is, uh, you know, Jesus turned water into wine and the Baptist turned wine into Welch's grape juice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he's got a couple. But, um, you know, when you, you really look at the Sermon on the Mount and what he was talking about, you, you know, they say, but I say to you, they say he's talking about the Pharisees and all what the Pharisees were teaching. I mean, it was an encyclopedia set of rules and regulations in addition to the 613 Mosaic laws. And when he was talking about, you know, Matthew 7, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, um, you know, who cast out demons in my name because Pharisees were casting out demons apart from the name of the Messiah in the name of God. And even Pharaoh uh, in those days with Moses, you know, their sorcerers were doing things that Moses was doing to a certain point, but it wasn't from the God, the creator God that we know. But um, and he says, you know, the, but only those who do the will of God. Right. Um, and but so many preachers will kind of use that on Christians because um, at the end he says, I'll say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And that's really people who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, as the son of God. They rejected Christ. And you and I had this experience with Jesus. And I'd say he'd have to be Jesus would have to be a liar to tell me he never knew me. But he might say, Chuck, you know better <laughs> when I do something stupid <laughs> or, you, you know, keep keep practicing some kind of lawlessness. But they always, and you know, probably with the best of intentions. Again, they're trying to teach obedience, but they throw out that verse like, like, you know, you might hear, I'll never knew you. I never knew you if you keep practicing lawlessness. It's like, no, that's not for me. That's for the guy who never knew Jesus, who's rejected God his whole life. You know? Well, it's talking about the false prophets. Right, exactly, in context. These and are, it tells you how you can recognize them. Right. And it says you recognize them by their fruit. So people get mixed up and think the fruit are the good works later on in the passage. That's not true. Right. What do what do grape uh, vines produce? Grapes. What do apple trees produce? Apples. What do prophets produce? Prophecy. Bel prophets and believers, prophecy. yeah. So you'll know by their, by their words if their false prophets are true. And he's saying... Look back over this sermon. If what they produce disagrees with what I've taught in this sermon, then right. they're false prophets. And it doesn't matter how many good works they've done. Right. Jesus will say, I never knew you. Right. Yeah. Because they face to face, they weren't getting it. You know, they're like, you know, so so he teaches the life of Messiah in a chronological order based on Luke, which is really, really good. Because, yeah. you know, you read through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John, you can get a little dis discombobulated on the order or chain of events. Right, right. But, you know, based on Luke, if you systematically go through it, you see the intentionality of Jesus through that three and a half yeah. years of ministry. Well, really Arnold awesome. is, famous, is famous for that work he's done. Yeah, yeah. So I just, I just love places like this where, like you said, taking classes, being equipped. Um, you know, and granted, like I always like to pepper it, I'm sure – you know, people who are trying to share the gospel, the new believer, he's so zealous. He's out there just sharing everything he knows. And after a while, five or 10 or 15 years, Christians who know everything aren't really saying much. They've kind of like gone quiet. I'm like, you know, but you know, at that point, you know, I'm always trying to encourage the believers, Hey, share, share with somebody something today, leave room for the Holy spirit to lead the conversation. You can't cookie cutter this stuff. Right. But, um, well, I'll give you an example. People, we find in America are interested in legacy and leverage. They want to do something with their life to make it count. That's legacy. What are you going to pass on? And then leverage okay. is what you'd get when you train the trainers. Right. For example, we've got a guy who graduated from our school who's in Pakistan. And uh, he's teaching 200 pastors what we've taught him. And then he just got permission from the government to build a church. And someone in Midland, Texas, gave him the money to build the church. And uh, he's just going gangbusters. But to take our classes, he had to get on his roof in the middle of the night to get the signal all the way from Houston, Texas. And he went through all our courses. He has a Master of Divinity, and now he wants to go on to get the next step. So that's leverage. Yeah. He's training 200 pastors in Pakistan. This is Pakistan where they kill people. Right. He's yeah. been arrested four times. 
when he walks around, he has to have a police escort. Right. Uh, just uh, where he's building his church, a thousand uh, Muslims came out to protest, and the government uh, provided him a police, uh, not him, but uh, his workers, his construction workers, provided them support uh, or protection, I should say. Yeah. Anyway, what a what a privilege to teach people in these countries. Yeah, whether it's, I bet. Whether it's persecution, and you don't have the yeah. Freedom. You know, the ripple effects go far and wide. And even through the book of Acts, when there was persecution, it caused the gospel to spread. And it got a lot of attention when people stand up for what they believe in spite of the cost. And um, okay, here's a, here's a saying, an aphorism for you. Yeah. The greater the heat, the greater the expansion. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Yeah, that works. No doubt. And, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's our job to support those, especially on the front lines. And um, I just love to ask the last question, uh, see what you'd say. I mean, why do you do what you do? And and uh, is there anything else the Lord put on your heart to share with us today about Grace School of Theology? Well, I do what I do because of what happened to me on that bus. And uh, it totally revolutionized my life. And as you know, that was, uh, well, that's when I was 17. And I'm now 77. And I could have retired a long time ago, but I, I'm <laughs> doing too much fun doing. in ministry. <laughs> you know, I did a concordance study on the word retirement yeah. and I could not find it in the Bible. I didn't find it in the old Testament. It wasn't in the new Testament. It's an older seer. I mean, overseer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm doing what I, uh, uh, if I were retired, I'd do what I'm doing. If I could, yeah. if they'd let me. Right. So, uh, yeah. as far as the school goes, um, we're just all about sharing a love that cannot be earned and it cannot be lost. In other words, you can't get to heaven by good works. You right. can't earn it. And right. once you've got it, you can't lose it. You didn't do anything to get it. You can't do anything yeah. to lose it. Yeah. And that's the love that people don't know about and the world is crying out for it. Every I've been in 38 countries. Everywhere I go, there's hatred. Yeah. We The, the world's hungry for something more positive. Amen. Christ is the, is the one who gives it. God is love. Jesus uh, Jesus is the love machine. No greater love than one who lays down his life for his friends. He did that for us. Um, yeah. The more you, 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 you study the life of Jesus, you see that what the fullness of God was in Christ. And um, like he told his guys, after three and a half years, right? Uh, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't pull that on the Samaritan woman. He didn't even say that to Nicodemus. This is after three and a half years, the night before the cross, he uses that line on the guys that have been with him who've seen some things over the years. <laughs> so, and then, um, you know, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's just, you know, that we're looking under Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. That's pretty good. And and back to your point, you can't lose it. I mean, Jesus said, I won't, in John 6, he says, I won't turn away anybody who comes to me. And that, And if you really receive Jesus, he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Right. That's not if, you know, so you're just dragging him in the mud. If you want up going back to stupid, one decision away from stupid, I heard a preacher say and uh, back to being able to still be deceived. So, you know, we need to show grace and mercy for our other believers, especially as well as unbelievers and and be winsome into the kingdom. Amen. Amen, brother. That's good. Would you like to lead us in prayer? I'll uh, I'll zoom in for that. I'll put the. Lower thirds away. I'd love for you to lead us in prayer, and I'd love to close. Ask God to help sure, establish sure. some more partnerships. Father in heaven, again, we just thank you and praise your holy name for this wonderful message of good news. And we're so grateful that uh, we don't have to earn it because none of us could be good enough. Thank you. And we'd always be wondering if we were good enough. We'd never have assurance of our salvation in this life. So we'd be living a have to life instead of a want to life. We love your message. We love your grace. And because of it, we want to live a life that glorifies you and honors you. So be with Chuck and his ministry. Thank you for all he's doing by faith. And that uh, we know that without faith, we can't please you. Yes. Sir. So uh, keep us healthy. Keep us moving. Keep us uh, speaking and glor glorifying you. We pray in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I thank you, Lord, for Dr. Anderson and the many countries and many uh teachers and students that have they've raised up over the years and god where you sit you see the ripple effects they go far and wide your kingdom is advancing we know there's still a lot of work to do harvest is still very ripe and there's still labors a few in comparison so we pray that whatever we do would uh, inspire 
those within the body of Christ to raise their hands. So here I am, Lord, send me and also support those that are on the front lines that have gone out uh, to make disciples. Show us what we can do next in our partnership. And we pray this in Jesus name, all for your glory. Amen. 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 Awesome. Well, if they haven't written it down yet, there it is. Grace School of Theology, 832-928-3581. You can text that number two or go to gsot.edu. Awesome. I like to do a fist bump at the end of the broadcast. So if you know where your camera is, you want to <laughs> lift it up. There you go. Bam. Awesome. All right. Well, until our next interview on Over All right, TV Live, may you and your families be blessed. You Thanks too. Thank you. How would you like to partner with Overcomers TV? Become a ministry partner, spreading the good news about your ministry and Jesus Christ. We're selecting ministries for upcoming episodes of Answering the Call. We can also help you produce your own show. Partnering with us is easier than you think. Just visit our website, overcomerstv.live. Be an overcomer today with Overcomers TV.